Hey guys, are you looking to cram in a last few minute details on the SAT math section before you take your tests? In this video, I'm gonna talk through some cram tips, some specific tips for specific kinds of questions to give you a little bit more knowledge and hopefully maybe a couple more points on your SAT math section. If you're wondering who I am or why should you listen to this random lady on YouTube, my name is Brooke. I've scored perfectly on the SAT math section more times than I want to admit. And I've coached dozens of students probably to perfect scores in the SAT math section. If you want more help with the SAT and you're not just looking to cram, be sure to check out our courses at supertutortv.com. I've also got a couple of books for the ACT math section. You can find those on amazon.com, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Find us there. As always, there's a blog that goes with this video, so if you want to read my tips instead of watch, you can head to that. The link is in the description below this video. Also there, we have a couple of goodies for you, a couple of presents for you for your SAT test. One of them is a cheat sheet for the SAT that has formulas and lots of things. I'm gonna reference it in this video at one point. And then the other is calculator programs that could also help you on your exam. So jazz up your calculator if you've got a TI-84 or similar. And now, first tip box and whisker plots. You don't know how many students I see missing box and whisker plots, and it's so silly easy. And if they had just known, if I had just talked to them for five minutes the day before their exam and told them this, they could have gotten it right. I'm gonna go over the main idea of box and whisker plots right now using a question spoiler alert from the May 2021 QAS SAT test. The daily high temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit for a city in the month of February in 2017 are summarized in a box plot shown. So let's talk about what this box plot is and what it means. A box plot is essentially quartiles. So you can see how I've written this out up here. 25% of the data is gonna be between these kind of numbers where these lines are. 25% of the data is gonna be between these lines. 25% of the data is gonna be over here and another 25% over here. Each of these sections is a quartile. The boxes represent the inner 50% of data points and the whiskers represent the outer half of the data points, a quarter of them over here, a quarter of them over there, right? That's all this is. And basically box and whisker plots are based on median because they're about dividing up the information. If you lined up all the data points that you had collected in chronological order and you cut them into groups, according to that chronological order, that's what a box and whisker plot is. So it works off of median, not mean, which I know screws some people up. If you've ever seen standard deviation, right? That's gonna use your mean, but the median is what we use in a box and whisker plot. So first thing that we have to know is how do we calculate median? Median is the number that's in the middle of the data set if you have an odd number of items, and it's the number that is halfway between the two middle items if you have an even number of items. These quartile markers are essentially the median of the first half of the data, okay? So if I've got an even number of data points, to find the first quartile, what I would do is I would cut out all of these data points, and then I would find the median of this half of the data. And I would do the same up here, right? If I cut the data in half and I just use the top half of the data, I would find the median of the top half of the data, and that would be the third quartile. So that's how we find the first quartile and the third quartile. This particular question doesn't ask about the quartiles, but I have seen students miss those questions as well. They sometimes come up on the SAT. The range of the data, of course, is just 73 minus 25. That's just how much distance do we span from the smallest number in the data set to the highest number in the data set. 25 is going to represent the smallest number in the data set. 73 would represent the biggest number in the data set. That's how a box and whisker plot works. Cool? Awesome. Now we understand how it works. We can solve this problem really quickly. What is closest to the median of the high temperatures of the city in February of 2017? And this is all just repeating data, so all we want is just the median, okay? The median is just where this line is. So where is that line? Well, we've gotta figure that out. Be careful because these are not one each, right? This is not 41 and a half. This is 43 and this is 42, okay? So I'm gonna estimate it to be at 42 and that's B and we're done, but it's not that hard, right people? Next on my list, I'm gonna talk through a scatter plot problem. So a quick tip for scatter plot problems is pluck points and plug into a graphing calculator into a program. So I am going to be partial to people with TI-84s in this video. If you have a TI-Inspire, sorry, it's not as easily programmed. So I'm not gonna help you out as much with this. 
First thing I want to point out on scatter plots is they're sometimes really mean about the way the graphs works. And I know I talk about this in a lot of my other videos, but you see how this is not zero, zero? It's not zero, zero. You see how this goes by twos, not by ones? Yeah, you got to pay attention to things like this because it can change the game. Now with slope, because this goes by twos also, I could count boxes. And so if this is over two and this is over two, if I go rise one over one, it's still one over one. So I could trace this on the graph and I'm not going to get the wrong slope if I kind of trace stuff out or eyeball it. But it's not always the case. So my best strategy for doing this is don't mess around. I'm first going to draw a line of best fit. Then I'm just going to pluck a couple points here. I'm going to pluck a couple points. This one is going to be 1222. And then I'm going to pluck another one. And then I'm going to pluck 2617, OK? 2617. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use my calculator and plug these into my calculator program. And my calculator will split out the y equals mx plus b form of a line. It's really cool. And if you want to know how to use the program or download the program, you can also check out our video on downloading programs. So go check that out. And here, I'm just going to do this by hand, what my calculator program would do, just in case you're like, I have a DI Inspire. Brooke, I can't do that. So I'm just doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is 12 minus 26. It's not that hard to do this, but in any case, your calculator just makes your life easier. Why not do it? I would already be done at this point. So this is 5 over negative 14. So then I can just get out my calculator and do what's 5 over 14. 5 divided by 14 equals negative 0.35. So I get negative 0.35. I don't have negative 0.35, but I know negative 0.35 is definitely not negative 6, and it's definitely not positive 0.28, so this has to be it. I got a slightly different number, but I can go just kind of off that, and then I'm just going to double check my y-intercept, which would be 26.2. You know, I flattened my line to here, but if I put the line up here, like right around there, uh, sure, that could be okay. It's not the worst thing in the world, right? I mean, this maybe is an outlier. I might peg it more down there. But I can still get this right because I'm looking at kind of the closest to the pin. I'm going to look at the other option, which is 25.4 or 18.2. 25.4 is going to be about here. And then if it's upwards, it could be like that. That makes zero sense, right? That 25 one, that's totally wonky. And then we've got 18.2. 18.2 would be down here. It does not make sense for my, no, my line of best fit is never going to be down there. That's crazy. So this is best models. It's not necessarily the best line of best fit, but it's the best one I've got here. But you can see how if I use my calculator program, if I just pluck those points, plug it in, and do it, it's really fast, it's really easy, and I don't even have to do all this math that I could make careless errors in. So that's why I love to use the calculator program. That's just a quick tip, quick cram tip. It's going to give you a few extra seconds, too, than doing it by hand. This is how you do it by hand if you want to do it by hand. And remember, you can just do partial answer. You can just work on the slope and then check the slope, and you don't have to worry about this so much if you're low on time. You can just move and come back and double check it if you've got the time. Cool? Okay. Next kind of problem people miss is function notation. And the reason you guys miss it is the SAT has been involving more complicated notation on its function notation questions of late. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like here they just use a dot, and a dot means multiply, and some of you guys don't know that. And this is super confusing, and here's why this is super confusing. Because if I had an open circle here and the same notation, but an open circle instead of a closed circle, this means something totally different. This means composite function. Composite function means you plug it in. So if I were going to do this, right, f of x, right, f of g of x, f of g of x means I plug this whole thing into everywhere I see an x. And that means I'm doing 3x squared minus 9x quantity squared plus b times 3x squared minus 9x. Okay. So if you did that, you made your life harder than it needed to be and you were wrong because that's a composite function. And I realize this is super confusing. This is just multiplication. We have this on our cheat sheet. You can see here some function notation tips. This means composite function. What does composite function mean? It means you plug everything in, right? Like I showed you there. This means multiply. An asterisk means multiply. A dot means multiply. This kind of a dot means multiply. This, if I just shove them next to each other, it means multiply the two. And here, f over g of x means divide, okay? So quick function notation tips. We've got more kind of little tips like that that you can go through on our cheat sheet. Lots of other little fun facts that would be good for you to know on your SAT. So I recommend you check that out. It's on our website. So here, back to this. So how would we do this? What I'm going to do is I'm going to just look at the x squared term, which is going to be the smallest term. That's going to be just this term. And I can say b times negative 9 is going to be negative 3. So I get negative 9b equals negative 3. And then I get b equals positive 1 third. And that's because this equals 
negative 3 over negative 9 if you need that interstitial step. And negative 3 over negative 9 is positive 1 third. Okay? So that's it. Again, I can just look at the final terms because b is in the final term, so I know this times this, the x term times the x term is going to form the x squared term. I don't have to actually multiply out the whole thing. I just know if I'm multiplying these two things times each other, I'm going to be foiling it out, and the last term is always going to be formed by those two, right? And the first term will be formed by those two, and the middle term is going to be a combination, right? This times this plus that times that. All right, just basic FOIL. There's some polynomial stuff in there. It might look a little confusing, but it's not too bad. Bottom line is you need to know what this means, and that means multiply. Cool. So that's all I've got for my quick three cram tips. We have lots more math cram tips, though, hidden in many other math videos here on our channel. So you can watch some more if you're looking to try to cram in as much math information as you can. Good luck on your test, you guys, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.